I've come to the U.S. to talk about a subject that some of you might have heard about, the American elections, and I will say that I am not a specialist in the American elections or the political process. I'm a, a fan. I love it. Um, I'm speaking from the heart and all the knowledge that I have and will share with you um, comes from a fascination with both the history of the American political process, but the, the where's and the why's of the political process, and the fascinating characters that we uh, are looking at today. And in 10 days, one of them is going to be the President of the United States. So I'm going to um, give you a little slide presentation that we put together for you. It's brief. I hope that it will stimulate um, conversation and questions, but also I hope that it entertains because this uh, election cycle, if anything, is very funny. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk about and see if I get this get this correct. Okay. Um, do you know who these people are? On the left is Thomas Jefferson. On the right is John Adams. They are our American founding fathers, um, the third and the second president of the United States, respectively. I, I put these two people here <coughs> to, to give you an idea of how, even though this election seems to be very unfriendly, um, it seems to be noteworthy for its nastiness. Um, this is not a new thing. Um, back in the old days, these dignified gentlemen were more than happy to roll around in the mud with the best of them. Um, for instance, Thomas Jefferson, as the present Solomon momentous epoch the only question to be asked by every American laying his hand upon his heart is, shall I continue in allegiance to God and a religious president or impiously declare for Jefferson and no God? This is 1800. Je Jefferson was also quite happy with slinging mud. Um, and they talked that there would be a civil war if Jefferson were elected president of the United States. Sounds familiar. Just uh, uh, within the past couple of weeks, you've heard conversations from supporters of one of our presidential candidates threatening the same thing 200 plus years later. Thomas Jefferson was called the son of a half-breed Indian squaw. Abraham Lincoln was the original gorilla and Franklin D. Roosevelt, who had polio, was a demented, paralytic cripple. And uh, these were gentlemen. <laughs> but we're talking about communication. And for the first, say up until the 1920s, from the beginning of the American Republic, communication was basically the same. Newspapers, cartoons, fancy slogans, and billboards. Um, up until the beginning of the, the 20th century, candidates never even bothered to go out and campaign. It was considered to be beneath them. So they had supporters, uh, trusted advisors, who would go out and campaign for them. Up until the 1920s, most Americans had never heard the voice of their president, ever. Did not know who he was. And except for some very bad pictures uh, in newspapers, wouldn't even recognize him. So you had William McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was nominated to be vice president because he wanted to be secretary of the Navy and they didn't want him to so they thought, well, what's a safe place to put Theodore Roosevelt? Let's make him vice president. Less than one year later, 
William McKinley was assassinated, and Teddy Roosevelt was president of the United States. And there he is. So you have Teddy Roosevelt. You have his cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In between them, who, who, Hoover. <laughs> An incredibly talented person who made some incredibly big mistakes and brought on the, uh, the, the, the Great Depression and the American response to the Depression. Um, not a popular man. But what happened in the 1920s and the 1930s was the advent of radio. Everything changed. And the pioneer in political broadcasting was FDR. He had a very unique voice and a very unique speaking style. He could speak to you and millions of Americans could sit around their fireplaces, that's where the radio was kept, and listen to him. And he made you feel as if he was talking directly at each of you. So it suddenly became very important what a politician and a presidential candidate sounded like. That man is uh, Harry S. Truman. Um, as you can see, all of a sudden it became important what you looked like. And no, no uh, political campaign was more demonstrative of this than John F. Kennedy, who was a very beautiful human being. Um, and he did not wear a hat. And he was for the new era. He looked great. His teeth, perfect. <laughs> However, that's John C. Calhoun, Vice President of the United States in the 1850s. You could look like that and get elected. <laughs> yeah. 1960 presidential debate. That's Richard Nixon on the right-hand side. On the left, confidence, handsome. On the right, needed a shave. You, you could see him sweating. He needed his hanky to brush the sweat away. Communication and politics had changed. From this time on, it becomes somewhat less important what you say, and a little bit more important how you say it and how you look. And the epitome of looking and acting presidential, Ronald Reagan. It's not to take away from his abilities, but he had the ability to make you feel good and make you feel confident. And he came along at a time when Americans were very unsure of ourselves. The Vietnam War had ended only five years before. We had a era of gas shortages. The economy wasn't looking good. Um, Ronald Reagan was ready to be president. And some might say that America was ready to have a Ronald Reagan as president. Even though his main claim to fame before this was governor of California, president of the Screen Actors Guild, and having died halfway through the best movie he ever made. Now we are at today. <laughs> so, we have two people running for president in the United States. Hillary Clinton, my former boss, is Secretary of the State, so there's a disclaimer for you. <laughs> and Donald Trump, real estate mogul and reality television star. Underneath, you see the pictures of all who ran for the nomination and who eventually all dropped out. Um, I won't hover very long over too many of them, but some of the names are familiar. Um, for instance, uh, George W. Bush's brother, Jeb, there. Um, a lot of people ran for president of the United States. A lot of them do. These are the only ones who actually got invited to debates. There are many more, many, many more. A little biography of Hillary Clinton. You can look this up on Wikipedia, but she was a, a Girl Scout. And um, she was, of course, married to President Bill Clinton. 
for vice presidential candidate Tim Kaine. He's a uh, governor of uh, governor of uh, Virginia. Was a senator. Never lost an election. Very popular in Virginia and uh, not very controversial. Recently gave the very first presidential address or uh, ele uh, um, presidential election address in Spanish. The very first time in United States history. A sure sign of, of how things are changing in America, and a sure sign of the modern communication in presidential campaigns. It's no longer in English, it's no longer white, it's no longer a certain ethnic group, a certain nationality or anything like that. The game is, the game is becoming much broader. And there's Donald Trump, born in New York, played baseball, has children, hotels, a line of steak, wine, reality TV shows, yeah, many casinos, wealthy men can't take that away from him. He has, this is the first time he's run for public office. And Mike Pence, governor of Indiana, his vice presidential <coughs> candidate is his partner. But what has changed? What has changed now is that from the disciplined political campaigns, from the campaigns where a certain core staff of experienced political operatives controlled the candidates, controlled how they looked, what they said, where they went, and what they did. Now, the cat's out of the bag, and political candidates can say what they want, when they want, and especially at 3 o'clock in the morning. They use YouTube. Facebook has its own election primary, so you see Bernie Sanders did pretty well there, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton. So Facebook is, is assuming a political life of its own. Donald Trump on Twitter is, is famous. It's his famous means to communicate, and he loves to do it at 3 o'clock in the morning for some reason. Some of the things he said have been highly entertaining. And he's been giving nice little nicknames to all of people who oppose him. Lightweight Rubio, he's speaking of uh, Marco Rubio, who was running for president and is now uh, running as a Republican to be reelected as senator in Florida. Bernie Sanders on Twitter, highly effective campaign, very interesting this year. He didn't. Uh, he didn't win, but he attracted a very large segment of the, of the young population, which, if you knew who Bernie Sanders was, would surprise you, because he looks kind of like your grandfather, not like somebody who would be hanging out with the young kids, but very much was. You see the hashtag, which Hillary, um, <coughs> hashtag everything in politics nowadays. Which Hillary is a reference to how we might have different opinions at different times, or it seems to. In this case, uh, Black Lives Matter activists is interrupting her. And Saturday Night Live. Have you uh, had a chance to see any of the Saturday Night Live debates? I highly recommend them. Um, political humor is and that's on the left is uh, Governor Chris Christie of, of New Jersey, or at least the, the caricature of him. Um, political humor has, has taken on a life of its own. There's always been satire, there's always been humor and people making fun of the candidates. And for the most part, the candidates like it uh, in the sense that it gives them exposure. But with the advent of comedy shows like The Daily Show, they begin, they have begun to actually have more political relevance than just being comedy. Um, they have taken on serious subjects and uh, people are influenced more and more by comedy shows than they are by candidates and in, 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 in advertising. Political candidates. I'll let you read that one.
You got that? <laughs> and satire. President Obama has acknowledged that nothing has done more for the political uh, cartoonists than his ears. Um, <laughs> perhaps an accurate representation of the American political process, except I think that in reality, it's not as simple as this. <laughs> But despite all the newfangled technology and social media, the posters are still out there. The same tried and true means of campaigning are still there. Candidates still give speeches. Posters are still popular. Slogans are popular. Newspaper editorials are, are, are popular. They're still reaching out in the same ways. They're trying to. Um, I think that's a sure sign that the process is in transition. Um, but transition to what? You will not get the answer to that question today. I thought this was interesting. What do you think about our elections? Um, seems as if you favor Hillary Clinton a little bit. Or oh, you think she's going to win? Or you think she's going to win? Who knows? I don't know. I have no opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so, we at the U.S. Embassy love opportunities to come out and talk. Uh, officers like myself who don't ever get involved in the political process love the, the opportunity to come and talk. And thank you all for giving us the chance to do it. It might surprise you because obviously as a representative of, of the State Department and the U.S. Embassy the United States government, I have no political opinion to share. Um, my job is, is strictly to come out and speak to you and answer your questions and try and give you an idea, and in this case, about communication. Um, but we do want to know what you think. We are very interested in explaining the process, even if we don't exactly understand it ourselves sometimes. Um, so please, here's our, our website. Go take a look. There are some options to make videos, cartoons, writing. I mean, it, it's a chance for you to express your opinions about how we're both the process, and we really do want to know. So, as always, for every presentation I've ever done on any subject, we always want to tell you that we're out there on social media, um, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Go to our uh, embassy at uh, US, uh, Ambashati USA at these addresses and uh, you'll learn a lot about what's going on in the United States and you'll get the official word from the US government. So, that is the end of my presentation. The original one was 95 slides long. <laughs> so you can say thank you. I didn't